Oh, all pervading personality of God. Are from my respectful basis. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute. And the primeval cause of all causes. Creation, sustenance, and destruction of the matter. <clears throat> he is directly and indirect conscious of all manifestations. And he's independent because there's no other cause beyond him. He only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge and imparted Brahmaji. Thank you. How did you know that? <laughs> the original living being. By him, all, uh, by him, uh, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representation of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature appear factual although they're unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma prochita kaito votra paramo nirmatsaranam satam vedyam vastavam atra vastu shivedam tapa trayon bulanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimba Prayer Ishwaraha Sadyo Hidi Avurudya Tetra Kite Behesa Susubis Takshana Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. <clears throat> the highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold misery. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. It is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam mm -hmm. by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hivata Bhagavatam Rasam Alayam Muhur Aho Raska Bhuvibhavata O expert and thoughtful man, relish Shimad Bhagavatam. The, uh, the mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, Text Number 
Huh? What? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Shinvata Swakata Krishna. Punyasra Vinakirtana. Piryantaksto Hyabhadrani. Vidunati Suhitsatam. You hear about Krishna from the Bhagavatam. I'm sorry. To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures, or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita, it's a self-righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend, and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta presu bhajesu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati utama sloke bhakti bhavati naistaki. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge as he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam. And from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajastamo bhavo, kamalo badayas chaye, chaita itairana vidam, ditvam sattve prasiddhati. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lust and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat tattva vijnanam mukta sangha When these impurities are wiped away, <clears throat> the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfect. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasamsaya siyante chasikarmani drishta evatmanisrade Thus Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the sage of Samsayam Samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, Verse Number 38. Swarat Putram Vinayinam Atmana susamam gunai Oya nivya patim boomer Abhyasin chad gaja havya Abhyasin chad gaja vaya Vaye. Vaye. Translation. Thereafter, in the capital of Hastinapur, he enthroned his grandson, who was trained and equally qualified as the emperor and master of all land bordered by the seas. Okay. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Dila Prabhupada. The total land on the earth bordered by the seas was under the subjugation of the king of Hastinapura. Maharaj Yudhisthira trained his grandson, Maharaj Brikshit, who was equally qualified in state administration in terms of the king's obligation to the citizens. Thus, Brikshit was enthroned on the seat 
of Maharaj Yudhisthira prior to his departure back to Godhead. Concerning Maharaj Brikshit, the specific word used, Vinayanam, is significant. Why was the king of Hastinapur, at least till the time of Maharaj Brikshit, accompanied or accepted as the emperor of the world? The only reason is that people of the world were happy because of the good administration of the emperor. The happiness of the citizens was due to the ample production of natural produce such as grains, fruits, milk, herbs, valuable stones, minerals, and everything that the people needed. They were even free from all bodily miseries anxieties of the mind, and disturbances caused by natural phenomena and other living beings. Because everyone was happy in all respects, there was no resentment. Although there were sometimes battles between state kings for political reasons and supremacy. Everyone was trained to attain the highest goal of life, and therefore the people were also enlightened enough not to quarrel over trivialities. The influence of the age of Kali gradually infiltrated the good qualities of both the kings and the citizens. And therefore, a tense situation developed between the ruler and the ruled. But still, even in this age of disparity between the ruler and the ruled, there can be spiritual emolument and God consciousness. That is a special prerogative. Srila Prabhupada Ki <clears throat> Well, we see that uh, Prabhupada has also said that uh, GBC means that all the devotees should be happy. Hmm. So, uh, you know, good management is uh, characterized as there are no complaints. People are satisfied. And how are people satisfied? Well, their satisfaction is material and their satisfaction is spiritual. When uh, your, the society is organized in a way that people have time for spiritual life, and they can practice Krishna consciousness as the main goal in their life, and their work for the necessities of life is simple and not uh, time consuming. So uh, today I prepared something that I said I was going to do. I was going to explain. Uh, uh, well, there's two main things that Prabhupada uh, emphasized. One was book distribution. That was his number one priority. And number two was farm communities. So why did he do that? Why did he? Uh, and he didn't emphasize farm communities. Uh, he, he started early in 1968, but... Uh, he didn't really emphasize them strongly until the late until 1975. What he did emphasize very strongly was book distribution, because he said you can rent, make the whole world Krishna conscious by book distribution, massive book distribution. Along with that comes prashadam and, and Harinam Sankirtan. But then he started also talking about Varnashram Dharma and cow protection and farms. So uh, we see here that Maharaj Parikshit uh, was able, was an able and uh, qualified emperor. And the only reason is that the people of the world were, world were happy because of the good administration of the emperor. Therefore, they accepted Maharaj Brikshit as the emperor of the whole world. 
And then Prabhupada says, the happiness of the citizens was due to the ample production of natural produce, such as grains, fruits, milk, herbs, valuable stones, minerals, and everything that the people needed. They were even free from bodily miseries, anxieties of mind, and disturbances caused by natural phenomena and other living beings. Because everyone was happy in all respects, there was no resentment although there were sometimes battles between state kings for political reasons and supremacy. Everyone was trained to attain the highest goal of life, and therefore the people were also enlightened enough not to quarrel over trivialities. Okay, so Prabhupada writes in September 7th, 19th, well, let's see, uh, we'll start earlier. Uh, he writes, in June 14, 1968, to a devotee named Hayagriva, he says, Vrindavan does not require to be modernized because Krishna's Vrindavan is transcendental village. They completely depend on nature's beauty and nature's protection. The community in which Krishna preferred to belong was the Vaishya community, because Nanda Maharaj happened to be a Vaishya king, or landholder, and his main business was cow protection. It is understood that he had 900,000 cows, and Krishna and Balaram used to take charge of them, along with his many cowherd boyfriends. And every day in the morning, he used to go out with his friends and cows into the pasturing ground. So if you really want to convert this new spot as new Vrindavan, I shall advise you not to make it very much modernized. But as you are American boys, you must make it just suitable to your minimum needs. Not to make it too much luxurious, as generally Europeans and Americans are accustomed. Better to live there without modern amenities, but to live a natural, healthy life for executing Krishna consciousness. It may be an ideal village where the residents will have plain living and high thinking. For plain living, we must have sufficient land for raising crops and pasturing grounds for the cows. If there is sufficient grains and production of milk, then the whole economic problem is solved. You do not require any machines, cinema hotels, slaughterhouses, brothels, nightclubs. All these modern amenities, people in the spell of Maya are trying to squeeze out gross pleasure from the senses, which is not possible to derive to our heart's content. Therefore, we are confused and baffled in our attempt to eschew eternal pleasure from gross matter. Actually, joyful life is on the spiritual platform. Therefore, we should try to save our valuable time from material activities and engage them for Krishna consciousness. But at the same time, because we have to keep our body and soul together to execute our mission, we must have sufficient, but not extravagant, food to eat, and that will be supplied by grains, fruits, and milk. So if you can develop this place to that ideal of life, and the residents become ideal Krishna conscious men in that part of your country, I think not only many philosophically minded people will be attracted, but they will be benefited also. So far I'm personally concerned, okay, then uh, we'll fo fast forward a little bit. One can advance in transcendental life by process of negativating, or in other words, means neg negating, the general practice of material materialistic life. The exact adjustment is in Vaishnava philosophy, which is called yukta vairagya, which means that we should simply accept the bare necessities of our material part of life and try to save time for spiritual advancement. This should be the motto of Nuvrindam. If you at all develop it to the perfectional state, and I am always at your service to help you by practical suggestion and assistance also. <clears throat> okay, so 
Prabhupada is writing. Then, uh, when we come later on, in 1975, he writes <clears throat> to a letter uh, to uh, Mahavirya Das, <clears throat> September 7, 1975. He says, the innocent people are being dragged from the villages and exploited in the cities. But in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna recommends them to remain where they are and produce grains. Anad Bhavanti Bhutani. Grow your food, eat sumptuously, and chant Hare Krishna. This is real life. If we establish such projects all over India, we shall be the proprietor of India. Similarly in the USA. And if USA and India join together in such Krishna consciousness projects, then the whole world will be paradise. Krishna provides everything, but we mismanage it. Even in this condemned world, he has provided everything complete. He is so perfect. Krishna wants us to pass on our days here in Krishna consciousness and then go back home, back to Godhead. This village program is for the ordinary class of people and for the intellectuals we have got our books. We are not lacking in anything. So that was very interesting statements by Prabhupada. He says that if we establish such projects, meaning village and farming projects and with maximum time for Krishna consciousness, we shall be the proprietor of India. And if USA and India join together in such Krishna consciousness projects, then the whole world will be paradise. Adibo. Then in another letter, he writes, and this was uh, hmm. another letter, I didn't put the date. He says, the mass problem at the present moment in India is actually a food problem. I have therefore decided to start some village organization program. Namely, people should be invited to live in the village, produce their own food stuff, grains, fruits, and vegetables, maintain a sufficient number of cows to get a large quantity of milk, produce their own cloth, eat sumptuously for keeping fit in health, and then they can regularly sit down and chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. I shall arrange for the irrigation of the land, and the people living there should give their labor for their own food and clothing and then chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and cultivate Krishna consciousness. Besides that, our men should go from village to village with Sankirtan party, hold festival, namely distribution of Bhagavat Prasadam, and introduce the people to chant and join with us in vibrating the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. In India, they are not less than 95% villagers, and Mahatma Gandhi wanted this village organization. I think this is a solid program. The people must eat sumptuously, not voraciously, and make them, well, that means you eat at regulated times of the day, and you just eat enough to satisfy your bodily needs. No overeating and eating all throughout the day. The people must eat sumptuously, not voraciously, and make them fit for working and chanting. In this way, they will be purified, and everything will be nicely organized. Okay, then again, he wrote another letter. He wrote the same letter to someone else. So at that time, he was preoccupied with this project for India. And this all happened around the same time. Okay. Then he writes uh, to Kirtananda Swami on May 31st, 1975. He says, if you give the right protection to the cows, then they will give 
so much milk that the ground of New Vrindavan will be muddy with milk. European and American civilization will be finished on account of the sinful activity of killing the cows. Actually, one should not circumambulate the deity when the deity is open, it is stated in the nectar of devotion. And I think you can close the doors to the deity room during Tulsi Puja and then open them again afterwards. Okay. So he's predicting that Europe and American civilization, European and American civilizations, will be finished on account of the sinful activity of killing the cows. Well, the same thing's happening in India also. Killing cows. So, uh, that's why we have to disseminate this message. Okay. And then, again, on November 28th, 1976, he writes to Yasumati Das in Gujarat. He says, You say we must have a Goshala trust. That is our real purpose. Krishi Gorak Shivani Chyam Vaishya Krama Swababa Jam Bhagavad Gita 1844. Where there is agriculture, there must be cows. That is our mission. Cow protection and agriculture. And if there is excess trade, this is a no profit scheme. For the agriculture, we want to produce our own food and we want to keep cows for our own milk. The whole idea is that we are ISKCON, a community to be independent from outside help. This farm project is especially for devotees to grow their own food, cotton also to make their own clothes, and keep cows for milk and fatty products. Our mission is pr to protect our devotees from unnecessary heavy work to save time for advancing in Krishna consciousness. This is our mission. So there is no question of profit, but if easily there are surplus products, then we can think of trading. Otherwise, we have no such intention. We want a temple, a gosha, and agriculture. A community project as in Europe and America. We are making similar attempts in India and several places. Immediately, I'm going to Hyderabad to organize the farm project there. We have 600 acres. We have the permission from the government. There is no question of sealing. You may call the Goshala Iskan Goshala and Farm Project Trust. So that's a very interesting letter. Then he writes another letter to Bhagavan Das on November 7th, 1976, and he says, Have there been rains in New, Par New Mayapur? There should at least be rains in our area. Yes, increase the flowers. You have got sufficient space. Produce flowers, fruits, vegetables, and grains in ample quantities. We should be fully self-sufficient. I like New Mayapur very much. So he started emphasizing this idea of self-sufficiency. And on January 23rd, 1976, he also wrote, we are developing a plan to be self-sufficient, namely to produce our food, grains, maintain cows for drinking milk, and weave cloth for garments. We have plans for erecting a magnificent international city based on this Vedic culture. For this purpose, we want a considerable tract of land and I therefore wish that the government may, government may acquire some land for us so that we may develop our plan. I hope you can help me in this connection. I would be very happy, glad if you could come to Mayapur, see our activities, take Noonday Prashadam, and discuss with me. So he's writing this to an official in the, in the Bengal, West Bengal government. So... What was his plan for New Mayapur? He wanted it to be a self-sufficient community and to erect a magnificent international city based on Vedic culture. Well, based on Vedic culture, what does that mean? That means that the goal 
of that culture is to help everyone go back to Godhead. And the way to do that is simple living, high thinking through cow protection and agriculture. And another letter, Jayatirtha, he says, this is in, again, January 22nd, 1976. Another thing is that the Grihastas may be encouraged to do agriculture. In the Indian villages, like in Vrindavan, they get enough ghee for their personal use and sufficient excess to be sold to the merchants, who then also get some money. Cow protection means good food and good trade. So I can give you suggestions how to manage everything, but it is up to the GBC to practically execute all these points. You cannot survive without my mercy, and I cannot survive without your mercy. It is reciprocal. This mutual dependence is based on love or Krishna consciousness. So then, uh, he also wrote a letter You know, so wrote an important letter. Let me see where that letter is. <laughs> yeah, June 4th. Yeah, well. Yeah, I read that letter already. Okay, so these are some of the points that he's made. Also, he has written in the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, several very important purports. And one is 117, Canto 1, Chapter 17, verse number, uh, no, Chapter 1, chap, Canto 1, Chapter 10, verse number 4. And he says, the basic principle of economic development is centered on land and cows. The necessities of human society are food grains, fruits, milk, minerals, clothing, wood, etc. One requires all these items to fulfill the material needs of the body. Certainly, one does not require flesh and fish or iron tools and machinery. So he writes, during the rain regime of Maharaj Yudhisthira, all over the world, there were regulated rainfalls. Rainfalls are not in the control of human beings. The heavenly king Indra Deva is the controller of rains, and he is the servant of the Lord. When the Lord is obeyed by the king and the people under the king's administration, there are regulated rains on the horizon, and these rains are the causes of all varieties of production on the land. Not only do regulated rains help ample production of grains and fruits, but when they combine with astronomical influences, there is ample production of valuable stones and pearls. This is transcendental science. Prabhupada continues, grains and vegetables can sumptuously feed a man and animals, and a fatty cow delivers enough milk to supply a man sumptuously with vigor and vitality. If there is enough milk, enough grains, enough fruit, enough cotton, enough silk, and enough jewels, then why do the people need cinemas, houses of prostitution, slaughterhouses, etc.? What is the need of an artificial, luxurious life of cinema, cars, radio, flesh, and hotels? Has this civilization produced anything but quarreling individually and nationally? Has this civilization enhanced the cause of equality and fraternity by sending thousands of men into the hellish factory and the war fields at the whims of a particular man? It is said here that the cows used to moisten the pasturing field land with milk because their milk bags were fatty and the animals were joyful. Do they not require, therefore, proper protection for a joyful life by being fed with a sufficient quantity of grass in the field? Why should men kill cows for their selfish purpose? Why should man not be satisfied with grains, 
fruits and milk, which combined together can produce hundreds and thousands of palatable dishes. Why are there slaughterhouses all over the world to kill innocent animals? So he continues, he says, Maharaj Pariksit, grandson of Maharaj Yudhisthira, while touring his vast kingdom, saw a black man attempting to kill a cow. The king at once arrested the butcher and chastised him sufficiently. Should not a king or executive head protect the lives of the poor animals who are unable to defend themselves? Is this humanity? Are not the animals of a country citizens also? Then why are they allowed to be butchered in organized slaughterhouses? Are these the signs of equality, fraternity, and nonviolence? Therefore, in contrast with the modern advanced civilized form of government, an autocracy like Maharaj Yudhisthira's is by far superior to so-called democracy in which animals are killed and a man less than an animal is allowed to cast votes for another less than animal man. We are all creatures of material nature. In the Bhagavad Gita it is said that the Lord himself is the seed-giving father and material nature is the mother of all living beings in all shapes. Thus, mother material nature has enough food stuff both for animals and for men by the grace of the Father Almighty, Sri Krishna. The human being is the elder brother of all other living beings. He is endowed with intelligence more powerful than animals for realizing the course of nature and the indications of the Almighty Father. Human civilizations should depend on the production of material nature without artificially attempting economic development to turn the world into a, a chaos of artificial greed and power only for the purpose of artificial luxuries and sense gratification. This is but the life of dogs and hogs. And then last is Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, 17th chapter, 3rd verse, where it says, although the cow is beneficial, because one can draw religious principles from her. She was now rendered poor and Catholic. Her legs were being beaten by a sudra. There were tears in her eyes, and she was distressed and weak. She was hankering after some grass in the field. Prabhupada says, the next sim symptom of the age of Kali is the distressed condition of the cow. Milking the cow means drawing the principles of religion in a liquid form. The great rishis and munis would live only on milk. Srila Sukadev Goswami would go to a householder while he was milking a cow, and he would simply take a little quantity of it for subsistence. And in the purport, Prabhupada says, even 50 years ago, no one would deprive a sadhu of a quart or two of milk, and every householder would give milk like water. For a sanatanist, a follower of Vedic principle. It is the duty of every householder to have cows and bulls as household paraphernalia, not only for drinking milk, but also for deriving religious principles. The Sanatanist worships cows on religious principles and respects Brahmanas. The cow's milk is required for the sacrificial fire, and by performing sacrifices, the householder can be happy. The cow's calf not only is beautiful to look at, but also gives satisfaction to the cow, and so she delivers as much milk as possible. But in the Kali Yuga, the calves are separated from the cows as early as possible for purposes which may not be mentioned in these pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. The cow stands with tears in her eyes. The Sudra milkman draws milk from the cow artificially and when there is no milk, the cow is sent to the slaughtered slaughterhouse. These greatly sinful acts are responsible for all the troubles in present society. People do not know what they are doing in the name of economic development. The influence of Kali will keep them in the darkest darkness of ignorance. Despite all endeavors for peace and prosperity, they must try to see the cows and the bulls happy in all respects. Foolish people do not know 
how one earns happiness by making the cows and bulls happy, but it is a fact by the law of nature. Let us take it from the authority of Srimad Bhagavatam and adopt the principles for the total happiness of humanity. So this is a little bit of a uh, information of the importance of farm communities. The number one importance is book distribution, and Sankirtan, Harinam and prashadam distribution. Number two is the farm communities, especially for the grihastas, and cow protection and land stewardship. And we should learn self-sufficiency, to be free of dependence on the outside society. We should not be forced to work, labor hard just to have a living. Uh, we can, you, and, one can work on, on small farms, produce all their needs, be self-sufficient, and have plenty of time for Krishna consciousness. So I'll stop there. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you very much.